Okay, open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. We're still on verse 3 and 4, the second seal. Verse 3 reads, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast, or the living thing, say, Come and see. And as I already mentioned, and I'll briefly repeat it, it's not like he's opening a separate scroll, a scroll that's different than the first scroll. It's the same scroll as the first scroll. It's just a continuous opening of now yet another section of the scroll giving us the information concerning the second seal, the second rider, another horse of the same kind as the first horse. And of course, we already covered that these horses are war horses. And there went out another horse, red, and was given to him that sat there around to take peace from the earth, from the region, we already covered that from a body of people, a body of people with a common descent and with a common culture, that they should kill one another. Does not describe what's been going on since the beast showed up, the seventh beast, and now the eighth. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now, we, let me go back to the word red there. There's three Greek words. For red in the New Testament. I might look at one Hebrew word tonight. In fact, I think I am. For red in the Old Testament. Now, one of the Greek words that's used is erothros. It's used in, you might want to write this down. In fact, let's just go to it so you know exactly why these words are different. Go to the book of Acts and we'll be going through the scriptures quickly here, so if you can't keep up, just write it down. Book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 36. He brought them out after he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and the wilderness forty years. That's one. You go to Hebrews eleven twenty nine. Like I said, if you can't keep up, just write them down and read them later. Hebrews 11.29, you have another reference of the same Greek word. By faith, in verse 29, they passed through the Red Sea. There's the word red again. Erethros. As by dry land. Now, Erythros is used twice in the New Testament. And both times are referring to the Red Sea, both in Acts 36 and I mean 736 and Hebrews 11:29. Now, there's another Greek word, purazo. Don't worry about spelling it. Purazo. It means to be red or to grow red. And there's two examples also. There's only two examples, and they're both in Matthew, chapter 16. So you know the difference. That's why I'm pointing these out. Matthew, chapter 16, verses 2 and 3. When understanding the times... Jesus says, He answered and said unto them, When it's evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky, referencing the sky, 
is red. And the morning will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Once again, mentioning the weather in the sky. So, purazzo, it's used when describing something to, that's going to be red or to grow red. Now, the word in Revelation chapter 6, verse 4 for red is purros. It's only found twice in the New Testament also. Once here in Revelation chapter 6, verse 4, and also in Revelation chapter 12. Let's just go there real quick. We've been there before. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red, puros again, fire-like color, dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Describing a great wonder. A holy great dragon. Now, you don't have to go too far or think too hard about it to make the connection. Revelation chapter 6 verse 4 and Revelation chapter 12 verse 3. These are scriptures that both have the word Puros in them, the color of fire, the color of destruction because of the fire, the color of war, and the color of bloodshed. This is not the normal Greek word, which I already pointed out to you. But a more specialized term. To describe something that brings war and also bloodshed. Now, the Hebrew language doesn't have any similar word like puros in the Greek. But they have a word that symbolizes blood, whether it's the blood of sacrifices or the blood of violence. But Something that the Hebrew does have that kind of pinpoints where all this really started, and we've been there before, is Genesis 25, 25. Let's go there. Over your Bibles to Genesis chapter 25. Verse, well, let's see, we might read more than verse 25, but. Let's start with verse 19. And these are the generations of Isaac. Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated, or cried out to the Lord, for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within her. 
So while she was pregnant with these twins, they were still within her. They struggled together. There was a battle going on already in her belly. And she, she said, if it be so, why am I thus? It must have disturbed, disturbed her quite a bit. It's not like the first time anybody ever had twins. She probably knew people that had twins. And they didn't experience anything like this. At least not what she was experiencing. There was a struggle going on, even in the womb. And she went to inquire of the Lord. That's a good place to go inquire. Give her credit for that. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations, or two people, are in thy womb. What? What do you mean? Two nations are in, are in my womb. They're both my children. They come from Isaac and myself. How can they be separated? And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. They might be related, but they're far from anything similar to each other. And as time plays out through the Old Testament, even to the now, related, but you would never guess that they were. And the two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. Now we know Esau came out first. Esau was going to serve Jacob. Now play that out throughout history up to the present. God's word hasn't changed. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. Red. All over. Not just red face. Just not just parts. Red all over like a hairy garment. <laughs> and they called his name Esau. What is that saying? Red is the color of Esau. Red is not just the color of Esau, but his descendants. Who are his descendants? The Edomites? Nothing new to you folks that have been listening through this series. The Edomites. E e Esau was born red. That's what Genesis 25, 25 states. Now the name Esau comes from a root meaning which means to press or to squeeze. Write that down in the margins of your Bible. Comes from a root meaning to means to press or to squeeze. Now the word Edom, which is the name that's given here to the nations in the scripture, when he which he founded, comes from the root word meaning. You guessed it if you're ahead of me. Red. 
red. The life of Esau and all the experience throughout the history of the Edomites, the experience of Edom is the key to understanding the writer of this fiery red horse. Has there been plenty of history of conflict between the two families? Starting with the two brothers all the way back in the womb? Absolutely. And these two families, which became two tribes at the beginning stages, lived together in the same land. You really think about it, what's changed? What's changed? This whole conflict, which we have in the Middle East today, I'm not talking about the Sunnis and the Shiites and a few other sects in the Middle East. I'm talking about between Israel and the descendants of Esau started because of the conflict between Esau and Jacob. Now, you go through the scriptures. This struggle continued with Edom constantly obstructing Israel even when it's returning from Egypt to the Promised Land. If you want to read it for yourself, just go to Numbers chapter 20. And this conflict, or that conflict back then, between Edom and Israel, it continued through the centuries until both nations were eventually conquered by Babylon. Now, the rider on the red horse, if you go back to, well, you don't have to go back. You probably already read to you. To Revelation 6, 4, has a large sword. And that large sword would take peace from the earth. And that large sword would make men kill each other. Men kill each other. That's like this message. Do I have it still here? Well, I'll have it here. I, I don't know what I'd do with that. From a HOF. From a body of people that come from a common descent and a common culture. To go back to another message I read to you before the teaching, a perfect example of that is the Sunnites and the Shias. The Sunnis and the Shias. That conflict started shortly after Muhammad's death. Now, you have to remember, Esau was told that he would live by the sword. Let's just, let's just verify that. G Genesis chapter 27. Let's read it. Let's start with verse 38, chapter 27. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? He missed out his blessing because he sold his birthright. Even me also, my father? And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven from above. 
and by the sword shalt thou live and shalt serve thy brother and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck now let me see if I can find another scripture real quick here Numbers chapter 20, verse 18. How's it read? And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with a bouquet of flowers, with a box of chocolates? No. With the sword with the sword Esau was told that he would live by the sword the advance of the rider in Revelation chapter 6 verse 4 go back to it represents an outbreak of intertribal warfare in that region by that body of people. Tribes in that area have always lived with an uneasy peace when there was any peace which was far and few between years of peace. Even today, it's festering. It's been boiling up for hundreds of years. And what you're seeing happening in that area of the world is coming finally to the surface. And this new and possibly the last generation will turn all their weaponry against their own neighbors, their own blood, their own kind of body of people with the same kind of descent and culture. Just like Revelation chapter 6, verse 4 reads, to take peace from the earth that they shall kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. You don't understand where this all began, my friend. It began back with Esau. We're just getting a clearer picture where these events take place. Now, I haven't identified the writer yet. I will get to that. But it's not a coincidence, as I've been saying, that a red color here is used to describe not just the events that have taken place now, but the events that have been taking place for thousands of years. And there went out another horse that was red and was given to him that set thereon. I want you to take a look at that phrase, was given to him or was given unto him. Now, it's not the first time it's used in the scriptures. It's used quite often. This signifies that it is an evil power. A warlike, blood-shedding, evil power that God is allowing to have whatever it's speaking about here. This rider of this red horse, this war horse, is given power to take peace from 
the earth or that region from those people. Now their ideology has spread throughout the world because they want world domination. They want everyone to bow down to Allah. They want everyone practicing the Sharia. But they're fighting within that region to see who will, not just against Israel, and that's a main target, don't get me wrong, but who will be the caliph or the in those last these last days to lead the charge. Power was given unto these people that they should kill one another. What does that mean? For those body of for those, that body of people, eternal strife. Or as we would say in this country, a civil war will take place, and it has been taking place. And one of the meanings of the great sword means that many people will be slaughtered and killed. Now, war and bloodshed comes with the opening of this second seal. War and bloodshed. But who is this writer? I've had some messages that believe that because I hadn't really mentioned anything about it yet, that it's just Muhammad riding another horse of the same kind. I don't think so. You want to know who this writer is? Well, you better email me or make a phone call and let me know that. And maybe tonight, I'll let you know who it is. Play a song.